Um, okay, I guess uh, we can start. Um, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for being here in this uh, Framemap uh, seminar. And uh, thank you, Brian, for being here with us today. So Dr. Welch uh, is a biomedical engineer uh, uh, whose focus uh, was on biomedical imaging. Uh, specifically, he's an expert in methods and software development for magnetic resonance imaging. His previous and ongoing work concentrates on overcoming the real-world limitations that hinder research and clinical applications of MRI. Strategies to overcome these challenges include hardware and software solutions, alternative data acquisition and reconstruction methods, novel MRI pulse sequences, quantitative imaging methods, and associated uh, pulse uh, processing tools. Based on more than 20 years of experience in MRI and six years of work experience on the side of uh, at Felix Healthcare, MRI clinical scientist supporting research project at Vanderbilt University, Dr. Well, uh, will acquire the knowledge uh, of these capabilities of the 3D and 7D human scanners housed at the Vanderbilt University. Uh, he applied that experience and knowledge to his own independent uh, research programs uh, as a Vanderbilt faculty member with contributions uh, in the areas of fat water MRI, uh, human uh, brown oedipus tissue imaging, and continuously moving table MRI. Most recently, uh, Dr. Welch uh, joined the startup company Hyperfine in 2017 as the director of clinical science with the uh, goal of validating the clinical utility of the world first portable point of care bedside MRI scanner. Um, so thank you so much again for being here with us today. And with that, I just hand over the voice to you, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, this is really an honor to present to the Martinez Brain Map Seminar. Uh, it's also first for me to give a talk via Zoom. I've been using Zoom and Google Hangout a lot, like many of you, I'm sure, uh, during our, this work from home period during the pandemic. Uh, but this is definitely a first to be giving a seminar like this remotely. And it's, it's also a great honor to be doing it uh, for the Martinos seminar. Um, thank you, Viv, for the introduction. That was uh, great. And I understand that um, it's common for people to ask questions as we go. So that's perfectly fine. Just get my attention somehow. Uh, some way, and um, um, I'm happy to, to answer questions as we go. Uh, so the, the topic is portable point of care bedside MRI. It's going to be about the hyperfine system, uh, but I'm going to divide it up into this, this uh, talk into four parts. Uh, let me advance the slide here. Um, um, and I promise this is not going to be a career talk or about me too much. I just want to make you aware of who I am, uh, my where I've come from, acknowledge the biases that I do have, uh, being an engineer and coming from industry, academia, and back in history again. Uh, I want to share with you just a little bit about what I think a clinical scientist does. Um, I think that will also help me set the stage for the last sections of the talk uh, as I present um, the, uh, the, the details about the hyperfine scanner and what we've used it for uh, in the clinic so far. Um, but before getting to the hyperfine scanner, I'm also going to acknowledge this renaissance that we're experiencing for low field MRI, which I know is uh, not a surprise to anyone at the Martino Center, given all the activities with Dr. Rosen, Dr. Wald, and Dr. Zimmerman, uh, who have been involved with low-field MRI for quite a while. And um, there's actually some connections to Hyperfine as well. So first, uh, this is my life uh, told as a series of logos from different institutions. Um, uh, I may not sound like it, but I'm actually uh, born and was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee. It's my hometown. I stayed there through high school, and then I went clear across the country to Los Angeles for undergraduate at the University of Southern California for a degree in biomedical electrical engineering. Then made another big change going to the Midwest, uh, to Minnesota for a, a PhD program at the Mayo Clinic, uh, a program in biomedical engineering there and worked in the MRI lab uh, with people like uh, Steve Reederer and Dick Eman uh, and uh, others that you might know. Uh, took a brief hiatus at Mayo uh, working in a different type of lab uh, focused on uh, highly customized integrated circuits and special purpose processors. Uh, but then I had the chance to get back into MRI and I moved back to Nashville to be at Vanderbilt University as the on-site scientist for Philips Healthcare. And I, I was the on-site clinical scientist for a little over seven years at Vanderbilt. And then I had the chance to join the faculty 
at Vanderbilt and did that for the next seven years as a member of the Department of Radiology. Uh, along the way, I completed an MBA uh, from Tennessee Tech University. And then as Viv was saying, um, in 2017, I became aware of this mysterious startup company in Guilford, Connecticut. Um, and uh, they, uh, some of the people that I knew in the MR community were being contacted and a few of them have ended up here. And as soon as I got wind of what they were doing here and looked at their intellectual property and patents, um, I, was, I was hooked. And once I met the team here, they're all incredibly talented, uh, genius level people that I work with. And I just did not want to pass up on the opportunity to be part of uh, this innovative MRI startup that comes along once, once a career, once in a lifetime. So uh, before I hop into what Hyperfine is all about and about low field MRI, um, I want to just spend a few slides on how I define clinical science. And um, I like to start with this quote. Um, I don't know if any of you recognize it, uh, Nullius in Verba. Uh, it comes from a pretty famous uh, uh, organization in the world. It comes from the Royal Society in uh, the UK. So um, it's Latin. Um, it literally means nothing in words. And the way I would interpret it is uh, don't take anybody's word for it, especially when it comes to uh, science and evidence. And so um, when I think of this, this motto, I think of, of other uh, engineers and scientists for, uh, from history. Uh, this is uh, Alessandro Volta uh, demonstrating his electric battery to Napoleon in Paris uh, in 1801. Um, and then uh, to the right there is Michael Faraday giving one of his famous Christmas lectures at the Royal Institution. And he, he was a famous presenter, uh, you know, known to be uniquely talented to demonstrate these experiments. And Michael Faraday would always uh, say that the best experiments and demonstrations were ones where it was obvious to the audience what was happening. He hated the idea of a black box uh, where the audience couldn't understand what was going on. He thought that was not that was not the way to go. So in other words, seeing is believing. And that's really true when it comes to, to clinical science or, or where, the, where science and technology intersects with medicine and engineering and the, and the basic sciences. So I think of clinical science as, as sitting right in the middle of uh, medicine where you you're have real world needs and problems like diagnosis and treatment and monitoring of patients. Um, but you're balancing that with the theoretical limits that come from science, the physics, the chemistry, and biology that underline uh, whatever technology you're bringing into the clinic. Um, and then that is closely related to the real world limits of the theoretical limits. So that's the engineering, the hardware, the software, the technology that you're bringing uh, to uh, the hospital or to the bedside. And, um, and the entire time we want uh, this endeavor of, of applying uh, engineering and medicine or engineering science to medicine to be evidence-based. Uh, and we are, go out there and we have to decide uh, what works and what doesn't work, uh, what's effective and not effective, and what's accurate and not accurate. And so as a clinical scientist, uh, what do I really do? Um, I'm, I'm one of three clinical scientists here at Hyperfine. And as a team, we um, sit in the middle of a bunch of different stakeholders. And I think this is familiar to many of you at the Martinez Center. I, I know that you have collaborations with other vendors like Siemens, and I think there's on-site scientists from Siemens there that work closely with you on a day-to-day -day basis. And so uh, we are the conduit between the site users and the clinicians, and uh, really the researchers should be here as well. And we also interact on the company side with uh, our fellow clinical scientists, the research and development members in the company, uh, the marketing and sales group, of the company and also the service organization. So we're in constant contact with all these, these different groups. And so if, if you put into words what we really do, um, one of my favorite is what uh, one of my colleagues from Philips used to say is we help the customers do what's not in the manual. Um, so anything that's not quite explained or the normal way to use a system uh, like an MRI scanner, we help the site achieve that. Um, another way to say is that we uh, keep the key opinion leaders happy, the, the doctors and the principal investigators at the site. Uh, we make sure that they're getting what they need out of the systems. We, we manage all these collaborations. We're constantly looking to improve the product, advance its capabilities and the clinical value of it. We're also in the mix for all the alpha and beta testing, assessing when things are ready uh, to get promoted all the way to a product. Uh, involved in all these problem reports when things are not working, all these bug reports. And a very important one that I, I learned many times uh, at Vanderbilt uh, was we just we dispel these misconceptions and superstitions about the systems and, and the settings, uh, the parameter settings. Um, I have their you know, setting to maximum is not always better. And that's related to a story where uh, one of the technologists at Vanderbilt, I won't name any names, 
uh, was getting terrible images and it turned out that he had set the water fat shift to maximum. And I said, why did you set that to maximum? Because it, it created all kinds of artifacts and it was low bandwidth and signal drop distorted. And he said, oh, I thought maximum automatically meant better. So maximum does not always mean better um, when you're choosing parameters on the MRI system. But so as we are, are looking at these, um, these, uh, this pathway of what we do in, in the companies uh, that we work in as clinical scientists, there's all kinds of ideas. Some of these ideas come from researchers like those of you at the Martino Center. It could come from the clinicians. Uh, those enter into a development pipeline and they get reiterated and designed and implemented. And then there's something to actually try out uh, at the site. And uh, as a clinical scientist, we're in this loop of constantly harvesting the feedback from the clinical partners and the research partners. And um, that's really the validation stage uh, where uh, you don't really know if it works until you get out there into the field and, and try it. And then ultimately, this is going to end up uh, heading towards a commercialization, a commercial launch. And that involves all kinds of stages of uh, interaction with the Food and Drug Administration here in the U.S. Uh, there's the marketing and the trade shows that come along with that, too. But moving on to uh, low field MRI, this is um, closely related to hyperfine because hyperfine is a low is using a low field magnet, and um, I like to point out, um, and I, uh, I thank my colleague Samantha Bai for making this slide that while high field MRI has been on this steady march uh, the last uh, three or four decades, uh, constantly increasing in capability and field strength, you know you can see that the first uh, one and a half Tesla was in 1980, and then the vendors, G, Siemens, and Philips all offered it by the middle of the 80s. And then uh, 3T came onto the scene in the 90s, 17 in the 2000s, and now um, Siemens has an approved 7T for certain indications, and uh, we're even marching higher uh, to above 7 Tesla to 10 and a half Tesla. Uh, at the same exact time, in parallel, uh, low field MRI never went away. Um, it's It's been here the whole time. So uh, we have to remember that the very first human scans uh, back in 1977 were on a low field scanner, a 50 millitesla scanner. Uh, Diasonics, Toshiba, Phonar, they've been using 64 millitesla, 0.064 tesla since 1984. And that's, that's the field strength that we use uh, on the Hyperfine scanner. It's uh, the field strength that uh, uh, has been used at Martino Center for some of the systems that have been made. Uh, so it is a viable field strength. Um, and it's been known to be a viable field strength since the 80s. It's just that the, the high field users uh, followed their path and, and the low field users uh, were doing their own thing. So there have been low field systems, 350 millitesla, 200 millitesla. Uh, I'd like to point out in 2003, uh, the Polestar system, originally from Odin Medical, uh, was, a, was acquired by Medtronic. That's an intraoperative scanner. It's 150 millitesla. There's, there's a handful of these still in use, and some of our collaborators have them at their sites. So it's an, a very interesting uh, comparison to the Hyperfine scanner. And I even include in this category of low field the one Tesla aspect in Brace, the neonatal MRI uh, that's out on the market, um, even though it's still a Tesla, uh, which uh, is pretty much higher field than a Hyperfine scanner at 64 millitesla. Uh, it is intended to be close to the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, and has a lot of advantages uh, to, uh, compared to a, a conventional uh, high field one and a half T or three T MRI. Um, and then finally, uh, in the in the recent years, uh, there's been a renaissance in research with low field MRI. Uh, I'm thinking of people like Adrian Campbell Washburn at the National Institutes of Health Heart and Lung Institute. Uh, Krishna Nayak at USC will be getting uh, a Siemens scanner that's a one and a half Tesla scanner ramped down to a 0.5 Tesla scanner. That's what Adrian Campbell Washburn uses. Um, I think of people like Orlando Simonetti, who's um, who's using the ViewRay uh, 0.35 Tesla scanner to get some amazing uh, uh, cardiac imaging at 0.35 Tesla. And uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, Synaptive, um, the company based in Canada, uh, that just got FDA approval for their every scanner at half a Tesla with high performance gradients that make some really nice brain images. So, uh, and then I cannot uh, uh, go, go without saving that at the Martino Center, uh, there is a well-established uh, track record of low-field MRI. So Dr. Rosen uh, has his work at six, uh, about six millitesla with his, his uh, large room size system. Um, Dr. Rosen also has deep roots connected with Hyperfine. Um, he was around at the founding, he was part of the founding of, of Hyperfine, uh, along with uh, Jonathan Rothberg, who I'll tell you about in a moment. 
And so uh, we benefited from, from his uh, pu published work and, and knowledge. And then there's Dr. Wald and Dr. Zimmerman uh, who have uh, some very innovative systems uh, for uh, low field MRI, portable MRI that might fit in the back of an ambulance or easily come to the bedside or, or be um, in a doctor's office. Um, and those are just two examples that I pulled out of the literature. So I, I don't wanna um, overlook that there's a very strong history and activity at the Martino Center. And uh, just, just coming uh, around to some of the, um, what can low field MRI do for us? Um, and some of the benefits include the reduced SAR uh, that scales with B naught squared. So as we go down in field strength, SAR issues go down as a square root. Uh, the acoustic noise in general can go much lower. Uh, on the hyperfine scanner, uh, we are at 90 decibels or lower uh, inside at, at, for our worst perform, you know, worst sequence uh, in terms of acoustic vibration. So that typically means we don't need any type of uh, ear protection for any of our subjects, not even the three month old uh, babies that we've scanned, uh, no ear protection needed. Also, it allows open designs um, so that claustrophobic patients uh, can feel more comfortable and just in general have more access uh, to the patient. The susceptibility artifacts go down um, would be not. Uh, this is actually a double edged uh, uh, sword because we have fewer artifacts, but we also have less sensitivity to susceptibility effects like T2 star susceptibility when imaging and, and that uh, category of scanning. So it, the effects are still there, they just take longer to evolve. And uh, for safety, the risk of projectiles is much, much lower. That scales with B-naught as well. Some of the challenges, the SNR is also scaling downward with B-naught. So we typically make that up with acquisition time, increasing the acquisition time to, to make up for that lower signal. Um, and uh, that's, we have to quadruple the acquisition time to get double the SNR back. Um, we also, uh, I, I put this in because in general with these low field systems, we are trying to bring them to places uh, that uh, are more accessible to the patient. So we typically are, are dealing with lower power budgets. And so uh, with those low power budgets, achieving certain types of sequences that are gradient intensive, like a diffusion weighted scan or an echoplanar trajectory might be a challenge. And finally, um, I, I wanted to mention that contrast enhanced imaging um, is not very well explored at the lowest field strengths. Um, even though those, those agents should still work, they should store in the T1s just like they do at high field. We already have shorter T1s at low field. Uh, so some groups, and that also includes Dr. Rosen again, he, uh, his, he and his group have looked at some different options for contrast agents that use different type of uh, physical agents like nano diamonds and others, uh, super paramagnetic iron oxide particles. Those kind of things that might uh, perform better at low field. I also want to acknowledge uh, Stephen Schiff. Uh, he's a neurosurgeon. He gave a plenary lecture at ISMRM in Paris uh, back in 2018. And he has been an advocate for low field MRI uh, for a number of years. Uh, he's collaborating with Leiden University in the Netherlands, working with Andrew Webb and working with sites in Uganda. Um, and from his point of view, he likes to point out that MRI is at the same time the lowest risk modality but also the most expensive medical diagnostic technology uh, ever developed. And because of those high costs, MRI is still very, uh, remains largely unavailable to most of the people on, in the world. And he uh, says that if MRI were to be made inexpensive, it could completely revolutionize global healthcare. Um, and he points out that the costs of the system are dominated by the magnet in generating those high fields. So um, here's a slide um, that Dr. Uh, Siram Githanak uh, provided. Um, he's also a, a proponent of uh, accessible MRI and value MRI. And what this shows to you is that around the world, some places are very fortunate uh, in Eurasia and North America and some of the, uh, the Americas in general. We enjoy having access to MRI scanners several per million uh, several scanners per each million of people. But then there are entire regions of the world in Africa, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, Middle East, uh, Southeast Asia, that um, don't even have a scanner for each million people. Um, and so these, these parts of the world um, would benefit from any type of access to MRI uh, and a low field MRI could, could provide that. And just one more from uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to say, well, so if we were going to go for uh, an MRI scanner of, of low field and make it accessible, we have to answer a few questions about it. Um, and some of those basic questions, and this is just the beginning of the list, is 
um, are you going to make this scanner portable? Are you really going to bring it to the point of care? And when I say point of care, I mean the bedside uh, there in the emergency department or the intensive care unit. Um, how are you going to make it affordable uh, and how are you going to maintain it if you're trying to take it to places in the world that have a lower amount of resources? If it is going to move around, how does it move? Who's going to move it? Uh, how are you going to power it? Is it going to be a normal power outlet or, or something specialized? Uh, if you're going to try to keep costs down and, and, and really go anywhere you want, how do you get rid of all the signal interference problems? Uh, we know that fixed conventional scanners typically are, are, are sited in a shielded room, a big copper box, uh, and that's not going to be available in general uh, when you go room to room in a hospital, uh, in, whether it's in the U.S. and especially if you go to sites that are in the developing world, uh, the chances of a shielded room being present are, are essentially uh, zero. Uh, once you have the piece of equipment and you've, you've solved all these above questions, how, how are you going to decide who operates it? Is it an MRI technologist? Um, is it a medical doctor? Is it a nurse? And uh, whoever's operating it, how do they keep everyone safe? And that includes not just the patient, but the operator herself or himself um, and the members of the general public. And um, most importantly, how are you going to get images from this low field MRI system um, that has lower SNR and maybe some trade-offs? You want to get images that are clinically useful, and so uh, you have to carefully uh, balance your decisions and trade-offs of, of, of getting that clinically useful image. And then the very last stage is who reads that image, um, and, and are you going to get reimbursed for this image uh, from health insurance and medical payers? So uh, given that, um, where are some of the opportunities for a low-field MRI scanner? And this is just one example or, or kind of a pathway. Um, if, if you're going for neuro applications, at the point of care, it could be everything from the ambulance, uh, which has been targeted by, for example, the system from Dr. Wald um, with the Hallbach array, uh, the neurointensive care unit, or the emergency room, or even uh, the battlefield, or other places where there could be brain injuries that are very serious, uh, but they are, are, are not even a place that has an established uh, building. They're, they're operating out of temporary buildings or, or tents. Um, this is the, the kind of play, these are the kinds of places where you could bring a low field MRI scanner, but you'd have to keep in mind some of these challenges such as uh, traveling around uh, through different uh, environments, uh, temperature changes and climate changes, humidity changes, there may be dust present, uh, especially if you're outside in a battlefield environment, and you're going to be constantly surrounded by other equipment, uh, patient monitoring equipment, other life sustaining equipment. Um, those pieces of equipment can interfere with the MRI scanner. And also, there's a possibility that the MRI scanner could affect those pieces of equipment. So you want to be very careful uh, that you have, have made uh, design choices uh, in the MRI system to not interfere with the patient monitoring equipment or the life support equipment. Uh, so I also want to acknowledge that there are systems out there uh, for these applications uh, in the areas of pediatrics. Um, I show two of them there. The Aspect Embrace uh, is the top scanner and then the Neona. Uh, system down there at the bottom, and uh, they uh, can be potentially less claustrophobic um, for the infant, uh, or you know the, the parents may be uh, a little bit nervous about seeing their child uh, disappear into this tunnel uh, inside this incubator, uh, but they can still remain close. Um, also, these also have the property of uh, a lower acoustic noise, which might require uh, or reduce the need for sedation, especially in children that are older than infants. And uh, the, the general benefit of MRI over other modalities is there's no ionizing radiation. So uh, we uh, are preferred over CT, especially for uh, children and, and neonates. So let me just return quickly to Dr. Uh, Schiff. Um, um, and his thesis at the plenary session was that one reason why low field Im imaging systems have not succeeded up to this point were because they didn't really focus on an application that was a low-hanging fruit. So he put forward that hydrocephalus could be one of those first applications to really go for with a low-field system. Uh, he pointed out that it's the most common neurosurgery in children. Um, it's an easy technical challenge. He said that he would be happy with a five millimeter by five millimeter by 10 millimeter voxel. That was enough for him. Um, I'm happy to say that the Hypervine system is, is well beyond that. And we have voxels that are much smaller than that because in his application, he really just needs to distinguish fluid from brain um, and doesn't need a whole lot of tissue contrast. Um, uh, also, uh, the magnet sizes don't have to be very big if you're going for infants or small children because their heads are small. And this also has the potential to make a huge impact because uh, without treatment, many of these children would die. 
So uh, what he does over in Uganda is he'll do this procedure called a ventriculostomy uh, that is a, an alternative to placing a shunt. Uh, it makes an opening um, in the lower part of the brain so that the cerebral spinal fluid can uh, drain and, and relieve uh, the pressure and, and uh, reduce the size of ventricles. Uh, but to do this, uh, imaging guidance uh, is, is critically valuable to him. And uh, he has this uh, trial that was published in 2017 uh, that uh, this, this is a viable treatment um, and the imaging really helps. The last thing I want to say before jumping into the second half of the presentation, uh, which is what you're all waiting for to see the hyperfine scanner, um, is to, to acknowledge that in general, any new technology uh, follows an adoption curve uh, that takes time. And in this case, I'm showing a uh, review of the technology adoption curve for handheld ultrasound. Uh, this comes from an Ant Mini article. And I think about this a lot because we have a sister startup company uh, named Butterfly Network. And uh, they make a handheld ultrasound. And sometimes uh, I'm jealous of, of Butterfly because they have an established market. Um, whereas we are trying to create a market. No one's really ever heard of bedside MRI or what you might be able to do with it. But even handheld uh, ultrasound um, is still kind of in the middle of this technology adoption curve. You could even think that they're just now about to jump this uh, chasm here from the early adopters to the early majority uh, going from the blue to the purple. And so they started in all these applications with handheld ultrasound that were uh, you know, coming from the innovative the early adopters, people who were willing to, to look at or you know, try something that maybe wasn't completely mature. And just now we're getting into the phase of handheld ultrasound where they're looking at applications um, in office space specialties, uh, in urban uh, primary care centers. Um, Butterflies is now talking about consumer um, use of their device, home care. Uh, it's becoming really important during a pandemic to potentially have ultrasound at home for patients to use uh, with, uh, by themselves or, or with the guidance of a, of a, of a doctor remotely. Uh, but so I just want to point this out that Hyperfine is at the very far left end of this curve right now. We're just now uh, beginning this technology adoption curve. And so we've probably got a decade at least ahead of us uh, to, uh, to convince the market uh, of what bedside MRI is capable of doing. So, um, oh, I just see uh, someone said uh, in the Q&A that Dr. Rosen did do some of his initial work back in 1981 at 150 millitesla. Um, wait, um, so, sorry, Ryan, I want to, yeah. now that you mentioned that, uh, there was a, a note from somebody uh, talking about uh, who Dr. Rosen was, because we have two Rosens here. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, I'm, I'm referring to Dr. Matt Rosen, not Bruce Rosen. Yeah, I, I should know better that. There are two Dr. Rosens at MGH and Martino. So um, uh, Dr. Bruce Rosen may also have some connections I'm unaware of, but uh, mostly uh, it's uh, Matt Rosen, who uh, I'm aware of his work uh, at his lab, and he's also got a connection with Hyperfine. So uh, in fact, that's, that's what I'll, I'll start with here, um, is Jonathan Rothberg. He, he is the founder of Hyperfine and Butterfly and five other startup companies here in Guilford. He is a biochemist by training. That's what he, his PhD is in from Yale University. And um, he's a serial, very successful serial entrepreneur and visionary. He, his first startup companies were, um, okay, so it was Dr. Bruce Rosen who did the 150 mil Tesla work. Tonight. Thank you, I'll, I'll definitely look that up. Um, so uh, Jonathan Rothberg, uh, his first startup companies were in the area of DNA sequencing. Um, and he started several companies in, in that field. Uh, his his vision uh, that he's, he's replicated several times over is he, he likes to take a complicated technology um, that usually involves a device and make that device much cheaper, much smaller, much uh, easier to use, and therefore orders of magnitude more accessible uh, to users uh, so that the impact of that technology just amplifies and, and geometric, geometrically grows. Uh, so that's what he did with benchtop DNA sequencing. And now he's bringing that vision to medical imaging uh, with uh, handheld ultrasound and now bedside MRI with Hyperfine. And there's his quote, he says that his mission, um, and that's across all the uh, four catalyzer companies, that's our incubator co uh, parent company, is to democratize healthcare by making medical imaging accessible to everyone around the world. And uh, Hyperfine is six years old. It just celebrated its six year anniversary uh, in April. 
Um, and so six years ago in 2014, uh, Dr. Matt Rosen uh, was with a group of people on Jonathan's um, uh, boat. <laughs> and uh, he didn't let people off the boat until they came up with some plans and ideas of how to bring uh, MRI um, to the bedside and make it portable. Uh, so, uh, I also want to acknowledge the team at Hyperfine. Uh, we are closing in on 40 people. This isn't everybody. This was last summer. Uh, this is just who was, uh, who was uh, able to go outside that day in July of uh, 2019 when we submitted to the FDA. Um, um, this team of people um, is in incredibly uh, talented. Um, so I, I have a deep in, uh, respect for the engineers and scientists that I work with. Uh, and I'm just one of many, many people here that have been working on this. Um, I point out that this, this uh, submission to the FDA that uh, our quality regulatory person, uh, Rob Fasciano in the center of the image, he's holding those binders. There was uh, more than 1,300 pages of materials that we sent into the FDA uh, back in July. And just recently in February, uh, uh, just a few months ago, uh, on February 6th, we received our 510K clearance for the device. Um, I also want to point out that on the right-hand side of the picture, kind of standing behind me, I'm, I'm on the far right, are three of our collaborators from Yale, the research associates who are actually uh, the frontline users of the system and who have been scanning with it. So uh, without any further delay, here is the system. You may have uh, gone to the website and seen this picture of the system. Um, this is a, a nice higher quality, st uh, studio quality shot of it. And what you're seeing there is a completely self-contained MRI scanner, everything is there. The only thing that's not shown in this picture is the power cord and the iPad controller that you need to run the scanner. Everything else is there. Uh, the top part is a permanent magnet, a C-shaped magnet with uh, the yoke on the, the left side under the blue covers. And uh, on the bottom, all the electronics, the host computer, the grading amplifiers, the RF amplifier are all contained uh, within the bottom portion. And uh, the other amazing part is that it's on wheels, it's on casters. Uh, the system weighs 600 kilograms, uh, about 1400 pounds. Uh, so we do have a set of powered wheels uh, down at the bottom, the larger gray wheels so that you can drive it around uh, without um, having to use your own strength. And uh, you're, we're looking down the opening of the magnet and uh, we, you can see the head coil um, that uh, is our first FDA indication uh, we are scanning other anatomies. I'll show you a few images from foot, ankle, knee, and um, uh, cervical spine and neck. So here's a shot of someone actually moving the system. This is my colleague, Samantha Bai. Uh, she, you can see she's driving it uh, with her left hand on a joystick so she can steer it around. Um, and she's coming up to the head end of a patient bed. Um, we uh, take advantage of the patient beds being on wheels themselves. They also adjust in height and can be angled. So the scanner does not change in height. It's always at a fixed height. And we just adjust the bed however it's needed to come up to the height of the scanner. Um, you also see that the bridge, that white rectangle, is folded up in, in this picture, but that folds down to close any gap or space between the scanner and the bed. And uh, I love this next picture. It's a very compelling picture uh, to show what's the, the kind of things that are possible when you have an MRI scanner of this form factor and this portability. And in this case, um, it shows what we could do for young children. So Oscar is three years old. He's actually the son of one of my colleagues, uh, Michael Poole, and that's Mike's wife, Fran, Oscar's mom. And so Oscar is able to maintain contact with, with his mom the entire time he's in the scanner. Um, she can uh, stand, stand next to him without um, any fear of, of, of uh, the magnetic field. Uh, she still has her cell phone um, in her, in her uh, pocket there. You just can't see it. And so um, we're able to provide this type of access uh, connect, connection, keeping the connection with the child throughout the exam so we can reduce the need for anesthesia or sedation, um, which is just not possible with a cylindrical bore MRI scanner that's inside a dark room. And so uh, what can we actually do uh, with a scanner? Uh, we like to say we can go uh, anywhere, anytime, I mean, within limits. Uh, but the, the point is that we don't have to have a special room. We don't have to have a shielded room. We come right to the patient's room. On the far left, you see um, an example volunteer in our mock intensive care unit here in the building. Uh, there's patient monitors up on the wall. Um, you can see a, a glimpse of the iPad controller in that picture. In the center, that's a real world ED observation unit at Good Samaritan Hospital on Long Island. And that's Dr. Dr. Chris Rayo moving the scanner around. The ED observation unit is an ideal place for the scanner because there are patients that are 
under observation after having stroke-like symptoms that are sometimes there for 12, 16 hours at a time without ever being admitted to the hospital. 70% of them end up having conventional MRI um, eventually, but they wait many hours for that. Uh, so in the meantime, Dr. Rayo can use the hyperfine scanner right there in the observation unit and uh, identify people who might need to be uh, prioritized or triaged to get their imaging sooner. Um, or if he sees something major, he can, he can start steering that person towards intervention. And just want to pl uh, point out again that the scanner uh, plugs into a normal 110 volt 15 amp outlet. So controlling the scanner uh, is very straightforward. We intentionally made it easy to use and intuitive. Uh, it uses um, a web browser uh, to control it. The host computer is uh, serving up uh, a, a web page and uh, the iPad controller is just, we're just taking advantage of the Safari web browser that's right there on the iPad. And uh, so we've designed it so that you don't have to be an MRI technologist to operate it. So of course, if, depending on the regulations of the state or hospital that you operate in, you, you might have to have a technologist doing this, but our intention is that a doctor, a medical doctor, a physician's assistant, a nurse, uh, some other medical professional could operate this system without a whole lot of training. And uh, we have proven that we can do that after about 30 minutes of training and a little bit of safety training. Uh, people, re research associates at Yale, UPenn, University of Pennsylvania, um, uh, um, and others have been able to quickly come up to speed and use the system. You don't have to make a lot of choices for scan parameters. There aren't echo times or TR times or TIs, inversion times to pick. You don't even have to plan slices. Um, once you're loaded into the coil, the patient's position in there, you're already at the sweet spot of the magnet. Uh, for certain, and um, the, as long as you've kept the head mostly straight, um, our slice coverage with our 3D scans is, is going to cover the brain very well. Um, and in the middle there, you see that um, a unique feature that we've built in is that if you put in an email address or a set of email addresses, all the doctors on the team, all the other uh, nurses could get an email sent right to their mobile phone at the conclusion of the exam, um, and the images will be anonymized, no PHI in that email. Uh, but if, if the team wants to know immediately what the result is of that, that portable uh, bedside MRI scan, they can have it um, in their pocket within moments. And then otherwise, uh, we generate DICOM images, uh, just like other MRI scanners, and we send that to the Hyperfine cloud. And then once it's in the Hyperfine cloud, um, anyone with web credentials or login credentials can access it from a web-enabled device, whether that's a desktop, laptop, or, or even a mobile device. We are also uh, supporting now um, sending of DICOM to local hospital packs, and we can also pull orders uh, from a modality work list. Uh, so uh, for the future, we have a vision uh, that will have a customized viewer that the viewer, um, not just the emails will work well on a mobile phone, but the viewer itself. And uh, this is gonna become part of a, um, a virtuous circle cycle of, of the device producing data, uh, sending to the cloud, and then there being applications that are driven by artificial intelligence, deep, deep learning to process those images or pull information out of the images uh, uh, for the clinician. So uh, you don't have to be a radiologist to get information out. So we're thinking of people like neurointensivists in the ICU or emergency room doctors in the ED that um, they might, uh, they would benefit from having some of these quantitative values about the images such as ventricle volumes or midline shift measurements. Uh, sorry about that. Oh, so uh, we have been in stealth mode until very recently. We exited stealth mode in October of 2019. We launched at the American College of Emergency Physicians in Denver. Uh, you can see a shot of the people around our booth. And the reason why we were drawing attention is we were scanning people at the booth right there in front of people. Um, we were scanning healthy volunteers so that we didn't have any unexpected incidental findings. But literally people's jaws would drop as they saw TT weighted images appearing on a screen in front of them. Um, and there's some of the nice quotes that they uh, that were shared with us, such as, can, can I buy this unit right now when the show closes? Uh, we rode that momentum to RSNA in Chicago in December. Um, we weren't able to scan people live at the booth because of RSNA rules, but we were scanning uh, phantoms and, and fruit. Um, and uh, we got a similar response there with nice crowds. Uh, so if, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, there's some questions. Yeah, from Evan Lee. So, uh, Evan, so if you want to ask. Oh, so uh, let's see. So he's asked a few questions. So, uh, so first question from Evan is uh, for lower income countries, low middle income countries, how will you determine the use cases? So um, I'm glad you brought that up because we, we actually do have a partnership with the Gates Foundation. Uh, they're funding the deployment of 20 scanners 
uh, starting uh, this summer. And uh, so some of the use cases there are uh, uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy uh, for newborns that experience that during um, labor and delivery. Um, uh, there's also just a focus on brain development um, and brain volume uh, related to nutritional intervention. They found that um, the brain volume is actually a great imaging biomarker to know if uh, the development of children is, is, is progressing as you'd hope. And so uh, the MRI scans could give you that, that information of whether or not a nutritional inter intervention is being effective. Um, uh, and so th those are the two that I'm aware of through the Gates Foundation, hypoxic ischemic cephalopathy and um, brain volume. Uh, there's also the hydrocephalus case. Um, there's one more. We've been contacted by uh, a group in Malawi um, who studies uh, malaria and um, the young patients who end up with brain swelling uh, from malaria. And so um, uh, they've been using low field MRI uh, for that, but uh, the low field MRI scanner is not in the same building as the malaria patients. And so they want the hyperfine scanner to be right next to the patients so they can scan them more often uh, and enroll more patients. Um, and so uh, Evan also talks about COVID-19, which is gonna be great in about five slides. I'm gonna share with you the impact of COVID-19 on hyperfine's recent activities. Uh, and, and I'm happy to say that we are actually making uh, some impact, some positive impact in helping scan um, COVID positive patients. Uh, on Long Island uh, at North Shore University Hospital and also at Yale, uh, just 20 minutes away from Guilford. And have you identified partners, non-governmental organizations? Uh, so Gates Foundation is, is the first major partner that we have uh, that will uh, help us bring scanners to LMIC countries. So we're looking at Uttar Pradesh, uh, India, Lucknow, India, and also South Africa uh, are two examples. And uh, last question, or no, there's a couple more. Is the Hypervine cloud linked with the but with Butterfly Network? So Butterfly Network has their own cloud right now, um, but we, we definitely share uh, knowledge and information. Um, and someday, I do think the Butterfly Cloud and the Hypervine Cloud will be able to uh, pull images from each cloud. Uh, they are our startup company, our startup sister company, so we, we do communicate with them a lot. Um, Oh, falls into the good problem to have, how fast can you build these? Uh, so uh, I'll just say that this year, we're looking to build uh, nearly 100 scanners this, this year. We use a contract manufacturer here in the US. Uh, return to the slide set. So just as a comparison, uh, the hyperfine scanner in front of the conventional scanner, we are uh, much lower weight, uh, 1,400 pounds instead of uh, 10 times that, 13,000 pounds. Typical for a for a, a one half Tesla scanner, uh, we use uh, much less power, uh, and instead of hundreds of amps of power, we use uh, uh, less than 15 amps. Our peak power consumption is around 900 watts uh, during some of our sequences. We've even operated on a lithium ion battery pack uh, that you can buy for camping. Um, uh, we have run the scanner off uh, one of those battery packs for an entire exam. In fact, we could probably do two or three exams on one charge of that battery pack. And this is possible because we're taking advantage of all the advancements that have happened over the last 30 or 40 years since MRI's introduction to the world where all the, uh, the smaller electronics, green, low power electronics, uh, we are starting to use artificial intelligence and deep learning in our image reconstruction. And I like to say that we're taking all of the technologies and algorithms and developments that MRI um, has developed over the last 30, 40 years and we're applying it again to low field and getting the most out of it. I know some of you in this audience are very interested in some of the technical specifications. I put a few on here. Um, so just remind you that it is a 64 millitesla, 640 gauss uh, static field. The gradient performance, uh, which I think is amazing um, uh, performance to be coming from a 110 volt uh, power outlet. Uh, we can get 25 millitesla per meter um, on the X and Y axis and a little bit more on the Z. And then our SLU rates are respectable. So we are able to do diffusion weighted imaging, uh, B values of 800 right now, and soon we'll be doing B values of 1,000. So in general, our roadmap, what have we done up to this point and where are we going? Uh, the FDA filing was for brain imaging uh, two years and up. Um, so that's in green there to show that we have that FDA approval. All the yellow circles represent anatomies that we've also scanned uh, in the lab or as a works in progress out in the field. So cervical spine and neck, elbow, hand, wrist, knee, foot, ankle, and uh, baby brain down to three months old. 
Um, the red circles represent anatomies that we think are within our reach. We like to say if it fits, it scans. Our pole gap is 30 centimeters. Uh, so if we can fit that anatomy, get it to, to the isocenter of the magnet, we're going to try to scan it. So we think the shoulder, uh, the, the rest of the baby body, the toddler's body, uh, will be able to scan. And uh, so now uh, I'm sure you're all been wanting to see some images from the system. Uh, these are the bread and butter sequences, the contrast that we have available, T1, T2, flare, and diffusion weighted imaging. All of these sequences now are based on a fast spin echo readout. They're all 3D. Uh, so uh, for the T1, T2, and flare, we have 36 slices. Each slice is five millimeters thick. The in-plane resolution is one and a half by one and a half millimeters for the T1, T2, and flare. The diffusion weighted imaging is, is a little larger in-plane, just uh, about 2.4 uh, by 2.4. And the scan times uh, for these, uh, it's under five minutes for the T1, seven minutes for the T2. Uh, we're now down to eight minutes on the flare. And the diffusion weighted scan uh, for the B equal 800 scan, that's about a seven and a half minute scan. If you get the B equals zero uh, scan, so you can make an apparent diffusion coefficient map, it adds 90 seconds. So all four of these contrasts, T1, T2, flare, and diffusion, you can have uh, acquired in under 30 minutes. And I want to share with you, this is a uh, uh, very recent uh, information or images. Uh, uh, this is using our latest diffusion weighted sequence. Um, and what you're seeing here is a little bit larger voxel. So it's 30 slices uh, that are six millimeters thick. Uh, but that is some of the best uh, high quality diffusion weighted imaging we've done in our system. This is a healthy brain. So you don't see any restricted diffusion and the corresponding apparent diffusion coefficient map on the right. I'd like to point out that uh, you still see the subcutaneous fat, the bright rim around the head, uh, because we're not using echoplanar readouts. We're using 3D Cartesian uh, with, a, with a pretty specific pattern in the, in the phase encode plane, the KYKZ plane. Um, and so uh, it's still high bandwidth uh, readout and the, the, the chemical shift artifact, the fat water shift is negligible. So uh, we still see the fat and it shows up bright because uh, the protons don't diffuse very far in fat. But we also do other anatomies uh, as works in progress. So uh, there you see some examples of neck and cervical spine. Uh, to do that, we used a different type of coil. It wasn't uh, the hard shelled head coil. It was a flexible wrappable coil. Uh, we use that same flexible coil around the knee and we have a foot ankle coil. Uh, we think uh, diabetic foot disease is a, is a good application for our scanner where the resolution, spatial resolution requirements may not be as high. Um, and uh, you're looking for osteomyelitis and tissue inflammation uh, between the soft tissue and the bone. Uh, those uh, visualizations on the right uh, are using real data, uh, data from the hyperfine scanner, and they just show some of the capabilities of the coverage and some of the things that you can visualize with our data sets. Uh, I wanted to show some uh, of these works in progress. I hope this is coming through the Zoom um, connection well. On the left is a animation toggling between two types of reconstruction. Um, you can see the yellow box moving from top to bottom. Uh, the top uh, thumbnail is the linear reconstruction, kind of a standard uh, reconstruction, gridding reconstruction of the imaging case space or the case based data to make an image. Uh, the bottom uh, thumbnail uh, that shows up large when the yellow box is around the bottom is the deep learning reconstruction. We have a team in Manhattan that specializes in um, AI and deep learning. And uh, what you can tell, I hope, is that the deep learning reconstruction is sharper, uh, less noisy, and the contrast is improved. Uh, so overall, the image quality is just better with the deep learning reconstruction. That same team in Manhattan is also working on tools such as this automated ventricle segmentation. On the right, you see two types of subjects. One subject has a subdural hemorrhage with a mass effect that's pushing onto the ventricles, and that can be picked up by the asymmetry and the volumes of those ventricles, uh, the, the green ventricles uh, larger than the red. Um, comparing that to a hydrocephalus subject coming from um, University of Pennsylvania, uh, where the, the ventricles are symmetric, but they're just very enlarged. Uh, so a quick overview of where we are right now out in the world. Uh, we're, we have nine scanners at seven different sites. Uh, our first site was at Yale University with Dr. Kevin Sheth. He's a neurointensivist. He's been using the scanner for two years um, and has scanned more than 200 patients in the ICU without any adverse events. Uh, soon we'll be in the emergency department at Yale They're working with Dr. Chaz Weira. We're already at two EDs, one on Long Island at Good Samaritan Hospital with Chris Rayo. Camille Beckless is a neurosurgeon there. We're at New York Presbyterian Hospital uh, in Brooklyn with Dr. Chiricolo and Dr. Schinker. 
at University of Pennsylvania. We're in the neurosurgery outpatient clinic, working with Joel Stein, who's a neuroradiologist. Uh, the uh, pediatric scanning we've done to date is with Sean Dioni at the Advanced Baby Imaging Lab, uh, associated with Brown University. And more recently, we've gone to uh, Stroke Rehabilitation Hospital here in Connecticut and Wallingford, Gaylord Rehabilitation. And our most recent high profile deployment is at North Shore University Hospital for COVID-19. So um, I know I'm, I'm closing in on the end of the hour, but I do wanna to get to this material. I think it's very interesting. Uh, as the pandemic began, um, and we all knew that uh, it was the lungs that were affected by uh, the disease caused by the virus, um, we at Hyperfine were, were wondering, you know, what can we do to help? And we didn't know there was anything we could do to help. Uh, until the end of March when some of these reports started to come out about, uh, in this case, the cytokine storm that was observed in the brain of a COVID positive patient in Michigan. Um, and uh, there are the images from a high field scanner of the cytokine storm, the inflammation associated with it, uh, flare and a T2. And there is definitely evidence uh, they're seeing in animal research that the virus can enter the brain. They're thinking it comes through the olfactory nerves. And we know that um, uh, the loss of sense of smell is, is one of those, those symptoms of, of the virus. So there are a lot of indications that the virus is entering the brain and that it's affecting the brain. So um, we were contacted by Michael Shoulder at North Shore University. And uh, you can see him pictured there uh, with his colleague, Christian Jocelyn, um, his administrative uh, leader in his department who helped us get the scanner there. And in a matter of two weeks from the moment that Dr. Shoulder called, uh, we had the scanner deployed there at North Shore. And you can see down there in the bottom, um, the scanner inside the ICU room of a COVID positive patient on a ventilator. You can see the ventilator in the background, that blue, uh, blue device. And you can see our system deployed there with all the IV poles and pumps and tubes and, and cords. Uh, just a few more shots. Uh, most of these are from North Shore. Uh, just to show you that we are in these very complicated environments with all this other equipment around, um, but we are able to get these fragile patients um, in there, even the intubated patients. You can see the intubation tube, there's space for that. And one of the uh, neurosurgery residents from North Shore uh, posted this on his LinkedIn profile, and that's him down there. Uh, a few more of my favorite cases uh, from the Hyperfine system. The top left uh, set of images are of a motorcycle crash victim. I mean, this, this is unfortunate for this young man. He wasn't wearing a helmet when he had an accident and he uh, hit his head on a parked car. He had undergone a craniotomy uh, to relieve the pressure on the brain um, at the injury site. And you can actually see in the 3D visualization uh, of our data, you can see the missing piece of skull. So uh, without that piece of skull there, he was still, we were able to gently put him into the system and scan him. And contralateral to the craniotomy, you see the bruise on the brain, the, the hematoma there that the attending that day at Yale said they were watching that over time. And that's one of this, the capabilities of our system. Uh, because it's so close by, it comes to the bedside. You can scan people uh, through time, as many times as you want, really every hour, every day, whatever's necessary. In the top right, you see a person at Yale who had uh, subdural hemorrhages on both sides of the brain. Um, underwent interventions, one side being drained, uh, the screen right, left side of the brain first. And then once we uh, imaged again, we could see that the left side of the brain was looking much better. And then after the second side was drained, the right side of the brain, screen left, the brain's looking much healthier. Bottom left is that hydrocephalus patient from UPenn, uh, who we got to scan upon follow-up after his shunt placement. Uh, but if he, if we had seen him in the ED because he was a 20 something year old young man, there's no doubt that getting those images in the ED, you would immediately know that those are enlarged ventricles for someone of that age and that he has hydrocephalus. And uh, final case here, uh, this is a three month old baby at Sean Dione's advanced baby gene lab. This little girl was awake the entire time. Her mother kept her calm and pacified by uh, patting her um, on the leg and also let her daughter chew on her finger uh, the entire time. And the baby stayed so still you can see the lens of the eyeball there um, during the, that uh, was, she stayed still for this entire five minute scan. So I'm, I'm really uh, close to the end of the time. I'll show you a few examples. People often wanna know how do we compare to high field images. So here I show healthy brains. This is using um, uh, software um, on the system from about six months ago. So they're a little outdated. That's a gradient echo readout for uh, the diffusion instead of spin echo. And uh, we, uh, we compare pretty favorably to one of Tesla. Uh, of course, the one of Tesla has beautiful quality, high SNR, uh, but we see the same anatomical features and markers. This is a healthy brain, so um, it's hard to say about pathology. So um, I wanna advance here and show you some pathology 
um, captured with our system, various types. These are hemorrhages, everything from hemorrhagic masses to intraparenchymal hemorrhages uh, there in the second column. Subdural hemorrhages are very conspicuous and easy to see with our sequence. There's two examples in the third and fourth column. We also see uh, ischemic stroke. Uh, so here you're seeing, um, even with the early versions of DWI, we were able to pick up these areas of restricted diffusion. Uh, this would look much better now if we were using our uh, updated diffusion with its fast minico. And uh, we've also been able to see tumors uh, pre and post op. So here's just a few examples of those. Uh, uh, gliomas uh, in the third ventricle, uh, uh, astrocytoma, and also seeing patients after they had tumors resected in the third column, and also some, met, um, some metastatic lesions. Uh, I'll close with uh, this uh, slide uh, as an example of, of pathologies uh, compared to three Tesla imaging. So this is our, a set of patients with various pathologies that were imaged on a hyperfine scanner and also imaged on a three Tesla scanner at Yale. And again, uh, those three Tesla images are beautiful. We're never going to replace three Tesla, but we are seeing um, the important features of these pathologies. We can see that there is a subdural hemorrhage, uh, that there is a ruptured aneurysm in, in that case three on the left panel, um, for example. So uh, we like to think of ourselves as a complement to the higher field imaging.